Hi, welcome to Atlassian Tech TV. My name's Chris Mountford, and I take you inside Atlassian to show you how we make software. This time I interview Lucy Bain, front-end developer from Bitbucket Server, formerly known as Stash. This episode is from a two-part interview. In the first part, we learn a bit about Lucy, the world traveler. Originally from the USA, Lucy tells the story of how she found her way to the Atlassian mothership, the Sydney office. We also discuss that most controversial of agile practices, pair programming, and touch on the matter of formal research into the effectiveness of software practices. In part two, we discuss her work on the front end of Bitbucket Server. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss upcoming episodes. Okay, welcome everyone again to Atlassian Tech TV. Today I have with me Lucy Bain. You're a front-end developer on the Stash team. Yes, that's correct. It's pretty new. Right, so when did you start? About two months ago. Two months ago. All right, now we're going to find out all the stuff that's different between Atlassian and where you've worked before, and maybe we can learn from, uh, from you at Atlassian how we should be doing things differently. Let me just start by asking you, how, where, where did you start in, in software? How did you start developing code? Um, so I actually, at university, was going to be a math major and took a computer science course just to fulfill general education requirements. Right. Um, and that course was taught using Alice. So that was my first introduction to programming was drag and drop and color coded. Yeah, Alice, yeah, I, that's, is that one of those, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, the guy behind, uh, you know, um, Scratch. Scratch. And, it's yeah. very similar. I'm not sure if it's by the same guy. I think it's by a school, um, yeah. but it might have been. Yeah. And it was, does that have a 3D environment? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think I've seen that. I, I can't, can't remember. His name will probably come to me. Anyway, so you, so that was at university. So you, so you didn't yeah. get any exposure at home. You didn't have a sort of, you know, PC and like programming it. I I had a computer, but we didn't do yeah. any programming on it. So it was just just right. until uni when I got introduced to it. Okay. And that was that in Sydney? No, that was back home for me in Virginia. Um, in, I went to University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia. All right. Okay. And so you came out here uh, for this job or what? Um, I, so I'm, after I graduated in Virginia, I moved across to San Francisco and right. worked there for about a year and a half. I moved to New Zealand and worked there for six months. And cool. then I moved to Sydney for about two years. All right. So you've been traveling. Yeah. Coding, <laughs> traveling. Seeing a bit of everything. All right, that's cool. So you're a front-end developer now, so you're specialized on doing, uh, well, I guess it's, that means JavaScript in the web world. Yeah, for me, that's what I've been focusing on. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be getting better at CSS as I go to. CSS, yeah, that's a bit of a dark art, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I found myself tripped up by a few of those, uh, those tricks. One of the things that uh, you and I were talking about earlier and uh, something that popped up in the Atlassian Extranet was a blog post you did uh, grew out of a comment and perhaps some conversations about pair programming. So, and I think it sparked a lot of people's interest. I think pair programming is one of those things that people go, oh, really? Is that how it works? Is it good? Like, is that how it should work? Is that going to be good for me? Am I going to like that? Or, you know, oh, that sounds terrible. That would be horrible. It would never work. It'll only slow yeah. me down, things like that. So tell me about it. What's pair programming? Uh, how do you uh, see its advantages? And, you know, what is it good for? Sure. Um, so I really like pair programming, especially as a new person. I think it's a really yeah. good way to get introduced to the code base and it helps me meet my teammates and know what questions I should go to them to answer. Right. So I think that's, that's a really powerful part of pair programming. There's lots of different ways that you can pair. The sort of traditional way is that you have two monitors and two keyboards and two mice with two chairs and you sit there next to each other and you work through it, but everything's obviously plugged into the same computer. Right. Um, so that's sort of the goal, I guess, um, but that can sometimes be hard to do because like, I'm not gonna lug around my monitor and keyboard and mouse. So my team actually recently set up a pairing station that has everything set up. So you just bring over your computer and get going, which I'm pretty excited to to give it a run. But you can also just come with your chair and sit and learn from each other, talk through problems. Have you seen all those movies where there's two hand, two sets of hands on one <laughs> keyboard as if that would ever work? Yeah. Tell me how that works. One person is in more of a driver's role, is that how yeah. you, you do it? So the person who's at the keyboard is the driver and they right. are the one who actually writes the code and sort of makes sense 
makes it syntactically correct and things. And then the other person's the navigator and they're there to spot bugs, um, sort of think through problems that could come up or like maybe you're missing an edge case and they can think things through a bit more. A really important part of pairing is to switch those roles off so that you're not always the driver or always the navigator because it's quite a different mindset for both of those roles. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that it was something that was particularly good being new to the team. So I I imagine there's specific advantages for pair programming for sharing knowledge. I mean, that seems obvious. So the benefits would be that that knowledge would be shared from someone experienced. So does that mean that they would be the driver or that they would be the navigator or you mentioned they switch? Yeah, so so hopefully you can do a bit of both sides just so you can better see how things fit together. I personally like being the navigator when the other person is more knowledgeable in a domain because I think that they can sometimes get frustrated watching me Uh, sort of not know what to do. Depending on how patient they are, it can be more beneficial if I'm the driver and they can sort of walk me through how to get there, but it is it is pretty slow for them, so it's a bit of a yeah, decision I, which I way know, you go. Yeah, I, although I found that that can be good to go through that because then, um, I mean, there's nothing that more encouraging than feeling like I need to know, I need to be able to do this. I need to know all of those keyboard shortcuts. That's actually something when I started at Lassie, and this is quite a while ago now, I was pairing on bug fixes uh, on Jira and we were using IntelliJ IDEA and I had never used that. So I knew none of the keyboard shortcuts and a guy I was um, pairing with, he was, yeah, Alt F9 that. I think you need to, you know, uh, and so I really learned them. Yeah. So much better. I definitely I always bring a notepad with me and yeah. like they'll do a keyboard shortcut. I'm like, oh, so what was that? I missed, I couldn't quite see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's always something to learn. Yeah. So we talked about knowledge sharing. So why else would people adopt this practice, do you think? Um, so obviously, yeah, knowledge transfer, I think, is sort of the biggest one. Mm-hmm. There's also focusing that it's a lot less tempting to like go to Reddit and check it out when there's ah. that other person sitting there. Um, yeah. And I think it's more engaging that you look at some code with somebody else and, oh, why did you do it like that? Like, let's let's right. have a little bit of a conversation and make sure that that is the best way to do it. Because right. when you do it on your own, you're kind of, well, this way works and yeah. I'm happy with that. And, and you keep going without always second guessing yourself. Right, um, so, the, so the result, the work is better as a result, I suppose. In, in theory, uh, the research isn't always conclusive that way, um, but I think it can be more satisfying to write it as yeah. a pair that you, I think I feel more comfortable with the code that's produced, right. that I understand it better. Probably pair programming is one of those things that is yeah, the least well-adopted agile, one of the least well-adopted agile practices, at least in Atlassian, but it seems probably across the industry. I think I remember reading on your, on, on your blog post that you've probably come from uh, well Ruby on Rails in a sort of environment where pair programming is more prevalent, better uh, adopted I suppose. Those benefits must be there, they must feel like they're there at least for for that community. Why is that? I mean is it is it all of those things you know the knowledge sharing and the team the, the feeling of you know gelling with the team, are those the primary benefits to your mind? For me yeah mm. um, I think so. They're People have looked into if the code is actually better quality mm-hmm. or does it get produced faster? Is it like more extensible? Um, and I think that those can be present. Better code happens more for juniors who are pairing together than necessarily for seniors because the seniors right. might have written good code anyways. Right. Um, so that value is sort of decreases as you go up. But yeah. it's still, I think those other values are still there even when you're a senior. Fair enough. Yeah, I've found that sometimes it's how much experience you have with that kind of software, yeah. with that part of the software. If I was working on Ruby, I can tell you I'd be wanting <laughs> to pair with some. I'm, I've got a lot of experience programming, but n- not much in Ruby. So I'd want to have some yes. someone who's more experienced with that to do it the right way. Yeah, I think a lot of it is that confidence that you can you can get started with something and sort of take it halfway. And, oh, like maybe that wasn't quite right. And when it's yourself, you're sort of like, oh, I don't know. But when yeah. there's somebody else there, then you stop and you have that conversation. And I think that that conversation is, is important no matter what your level, if, if it's something that you're not comfortable with. Yeah. yeah. I was really disappointed. I did some research on pairing recently and it's like, actually, it doesn't necessarily, it's not faster, it doesn't have less value. Actually, here's something that years ago, my, uh, when we were adopting agile software development practices at uh, the University of New South Wales, I was doing a project there. And one of the professors who is uh, quite famous, quite, um, you know, his, his name is in people where he's sort of been doing it for years. I think he might even be retired now. 
Uh, and his uh, team did some study of, of, of our team. So they were, they were observing <laughs> what we were doing, what practices we were following, uh, stand-ups and things were the first things with, that uh, we started adopting in Agile. And, you know, what was funny there is that their research was sort of slightly interrupted by our practices because we said, well, we're not interested so much in adopting all of the practices as a goal. The practices are not the goal. Mm. Practices are a way you get to the actual goal, which is to ship this software to our users. And, right. and so if it doesn't help us, then we're not going to keep doing it. And, and we're going to try and use our sense of how things are going in order to decide whether we like it. You know, dynamically adjusting to the environment based on your own intuitive sense. What if people want to do pair programming because of the way that they get to know their team members? Are you measuring that? Right. Yeah. That's a wrap for another episode of Atlassian Tech TV. Please subscribe and follow us on Twitter. We've also got tons of stuff on our blog at developer.atlassian.com. 